we finally figured out our 6,000 different tech issues. Um, I'm just here to welcome you. Um, Chad Kautzer will be introducing this panel, but um, I just wanna say thanks to you all for coming. I'm happy to see all of you here. Um, and I'm Julie Carr of the English Department and Chair of Women and Gender Studies. And I'm one of the founding board members of the April Institute, which you'll hear a little bit more about from Chad. Um, so I just also wanna thank the English Department, the Department of History and of Geography for um, support, for financial support and the Center for Humanities and Arts and the Pre President's Fund for the Humanities. So we've had four events this year. This is our last one for the year and um, uh, these different uh, units supported us in those four. So thanks to them for that. Um, so Chad Kautzer will, um, as I said, introduce this um, today's panel. Chad Kautzer is a professor of philosophy at Lehigh University. Um, he's the author of Radical Philosophy, a fantastic book out with Routledge. Um, and he is also one of the founding uh, board members of the April Institute for Anti-Fascist Research and Education, and um, is my very good friend, and I welcome him to stand up. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Julie. Thanks for everyone um, for coming. Thanks for the tech people for helping us set up the live stream. Um, greetings to looking at the camera back there, those joining us uh, remotely, we really appreciate it. Um, if you hear children during this event, those are uh, my children, um, they have joined us too. Um, let me first thank Julie Carr, um, the amazing Julie Carr. Uh, she's incredible and she made this event possible. And this is the fourth, this is the fourth event um, that we've organized here and that Julie has spearheaded on Boulder's campus or with Boulder people, because two of them were um, online. Um, great events, and we really appreciate uh, all the work that she's done. Julie is an inspirational poet, uh, writer, errant. Um, she's an author and a builder of worlds in word and deed. She's a pragmatic organizer of people a creator of spaces and platforms that allow for new possibilities and constellations to emerge. And although the threats that we face today can be overwhelming if you really let yourself feel them, as Julie does, she keeps pushing through and holds the ground and keeps building through it all. And for that, we deeply appreciate um, her and all the work that she does. Actually, next month, we're gonna be hosting Julie in New York for a talk um, through the April Institute. It's gonna be about her forthcoming book, um, Mud, Blood, and Ghost, Populism, Eugenics, and Spiritualism in the American West. Um, and we're also going to be shooting a short documentary film about Julie and this book. And it's going to include um, some sites in New York that are relevant to the history of eugenics. Um, and proto-fascist thinking. We're very excited about that. Um, the April Institute, which is a sponsor of this uh, event um, tonight, is a research and education nonprofit. It's based in New York. Um, our goal is to tell the stories of the history of anti-fascist resistance, make people aware of the history of fascist movements and tendencies in the US, um, and to build resources for people to use, um, to learn about those, to be inspired by um, the anti-fascist histories um, and to make those changes that need to be made today. Um, we're building digital exhibitions, teaching resources. We're working on publications, a pamphlet series. Um, we're very excited. Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but our first speaker is also with the April Institute, Anna and she's gonna launch a podcast uh, very soon on fascism and anti-fascism in America. And we're very, very excited about, about that. So I encourage you, if you're interested um, in checking out what we've done so far, if you're interested in getting involved with us to do things in the future, check out our website, aprilinstitute.org, um, reach out to any of the speakers, reach out to Julie, reach out to myself. 
Okay. Oh, and I should say, uh, you know, I mentioned that we're building digital exhibitions. Um, one of the first exhibitions we're going to develop is on the Hands Off Ethiopia campaign, um, which is the topic of today's um, discussion. We're very excited. We're gonna rely on the work of the speakers um, here today, their expertise. Um, and so look for that in the future as well. Okay, with that, let me start uh, introducing the speakers. Um, in the order that they'll be presenting today. So Anna uh, Dunsing, Dunsing um, is a historian and postdoctoral fellow at the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and Africana Studies at the University of Virginia. She received her PhD in history and African American studies from Yale University in 2022. Anna is a historian of the US and the world specializing in transnational African American history Black radicalism and the evolving global politics of white supremacy and right wing extremism across the 20th century. She is currently working on her first book manuscript, tentatively entitled Fascism is Already Here Civil Rights and the Making of a Black Anti Fascist Tradition. In addition to her scholarship, Anna has a deep commitment to public humanities, work that includes researching and teaching immigration history at the Lower East Side Tenement Museum in New York fantastic place. If you haven't been there, I recommend you go. Mining histories of gun violence and the origins of the National Rifle Association with a moving image artist at the Park Avenue Armory in New York. And more recently, helping to develop anti-fascist education programs through the April Institute. And as I mentioned, she'll be developing this podcast very soon. Joseph Franzak is our second uh, presenter. He's an associate research scholar in the history department at Princeton University. His book, Everything is Possible, Anti-Fascism and the Left in the Age of Fascism was just released by Yale University Press, it's still warm. And I'm, I'm making my way through it and it's brilliant. It explains how anti-fascism became a global political cause in the mid 1930s and explores how the anti-fascist left um, of these years helped shape today's political world, very much um, a concern that we have. So his article, Local People's Global Politics, A Transnational History of the Hands-Off Ethiopia Movement of 1935, was selected by Oxford University Press for its 2016 must-read foreign relations history list. Minka Makalani is our third speaker. He's an associate professor of history and director of the Center for Africana Studies at Johns Hopkins University. His first book, In the Cause of Freedom, Radical Black Internationalism from Harlem to London, 1917 to 1939, also brilliant, I recommend it to everyone, explores how early 20th century uh, Caribbean radicals in Harlem and London drew on their experiences with racism, colonial domination, and political organizing to forge a black international, internationalist politics that engaged with Marxism, but pushed beyond its organizational and theoretical parameters. He is currently working on two book projects, one about C.L.R. James and his return to Trinidad, and the other a collection of essays on how diverse modes of black intellectual production offer the possibility of moving beyond established theoretical frames and practices. Okay, one word about format before I turn it over um, to Anna, who will be our first speaker and she's joining us remotely. Um, we thought each of us uh, or each of the presenters, uh, those in person would come up to the podium and speak for five to 10 minutes. Um, and after all the presenters are finished, we um, are encouraging them to have a discussion amongst themselves um, for 15 plus minutes ask each other questions, make connections between presentations, and then we'll open it up for Q&A to the general audience, okay? And with that, I want to welcome Anna Dunsing. Are you there? Yes. Welcome, Anna. Hello. Can you all hear me? Yes. yes. Amazing. Okay, cool. Well, thank you. Um, thank you so much for being here. It was not my, it was not my, my first choice to be zooming in in this sort of big brother-like fashion. Um, but I have learned my lesson for the second time now about traveling multi-leg journeys out of a regional airport in central Virginia on a windy day. 
Um, so before I go into my comments, I just I want to I want to also offer my gratitude to Julie Carr and everyone else on the ground who made this event possible. And, and I'm also grateful to my my fellow co-organizers co at the April Institute. Um, and I do really also want to say I am so excited to be in conversation with Minka Makalani and Joe Franchek. Um, I do mean it when I say both of your books are literally on my desk. Um, you just got Joe's here and um, Dr. Makalani, yours is yours is at my office. Um, but I just I just just because both of their their sort of their, their body of scholarship has been indispensable to me in developing my own work. And um, this really feels, yeah, I'm I'm so excited. Um, so I thought uh, as, as, as a way to open up the conversation and knowing a little bit about what my co-presenters are, are, are gonna speak to at the start, that I would, um, I would open with two unifying ideas that really drive my research, uh, which in turn shape my perspective, uh, both as a historian thinking about the past, as well as as an activist um, deeply committed to you know naming and organizing against uh, the fascist threat in the present, and so the first, the first organizing idea, the first motivation um, for my work is that uh, is about the Black anti-fascist tradition, right? Which is in, in my work, right? As a scholar, as a historian of the United States, I approach that as a as a Black radical internationalist political tradition rooted in the United States, though there are many other iterations around the world across many different eras. But I approach the Black anti-fascist tradition essentially as a sensitive, highly influential, always evolving and deeply multifaceted political phenomenon that spans the 20th century and, and courses up into our present moment. Um, we can track it in the form of Black radical thought, grassroots organizing, armed self-defense, uh, mutual aid, solidarity building, and other diverse efforts to dismantle the racist and capitalist white world order and to dream and build the world anew. And for me, a focus on a, a, a Black anti fascist tradition invites us to think about anti fascism as one thread among many. Um, anti fascism. As, as a unifying force, as something bound up with anti-racist, anti-capitalist, and anti-colonial struggle. And um, I think most, most important um, in this conversation, especially to think about um, an anti-fascist perspective, both in theory and practice, that, that is committed to formulating fascism beyond the geographic and temporal bounds of interwar Europe. So that's the kind of first First unifying idea, the second one really follows that, which says, you know, by taking Black anti fascist politics seriously, by studying it closely in all its richness, in its many manifestations, really dating back um, the past 100 years from this present moment, we open up an abundance of really studied and sophisticated and deeply serious answers to the question of fascism in the United States, past and present. Um, and for me, we really um, open ourselves up to a rich archive uh, of people who have been engaged in the question of what does fascism look like in the United States after 1945, especially, um, right? Seeing it as this many headed hydra, not just, you know, I think what people might expect, which is the armed and uniformed rabble rouser, but also as, as a kind of low hum um, in its more incipient and lying in wait forms. Uh, so with those two establishing ideas in mind, I, I uh, thought, you know, in setting up this conversation, we're going to be thinking about Black anti-fascist politics writ large, thinking about them in this first swelling global crescendo in the form of the hands-off Ethiopia movement, which Joe um, has, has written about so beautifully in his new book. Um, but I, I do think over the course of this conversation, we're going to be moving in long arcs. We're going to be um, putting the past in conversation with the present and um, you know, thinking about what our study of the past can, can do for us in confronting the present crisis. Um, and, and I thought in it, my portion just to start would be to look at kind of the earliest murmurings of a black anti-fascist tradition. What I, you know, not necessarily looking strictly to black radical intellectuals or strictly to 
um, you know, grassroots street classic street clashes, but but thinking about something that I and my work um, have 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 often thought about as a kind of common sense anti-fascism in the black public sphere in the interwar United States. And I want to start there and, and give you a little bit of background there, because when I was just starting out in my research, um, two things that really stood out to me in, in tapping into the discourse about sort of the, the fascism debates is that it, it was really frustrating to me that many scholars and pundits in the no camp, either with regard to the past or more contemporary movements, um, they were making claims about past attitudes or past political situations in the United States, but it really seemed to me that none of them had taken up a black newspaper from the 1920s or 1930s or 40s, or and they weren't engaging with black radical intellectuals and scholars of the black radical tradition. And similarly, years ago, reading books that were tracking how Americans responded to the rise of fascism, as, as in fascist movements in Europe, um, and what kind of public responses were. In those footnotes, I wasn't seeing um, black newspapers or black poets and scholars and public figures, and journalists in those footnotes. So, so even just a cursory look at those archives really reveal that there were very different conversations happening in the black public sphere about fascism, both abroad and at home in the interwar period. And I think more importantly, very different attitudes and very different conversations about what was to be done about the fascist threat, uh, both abroad at home, what, what the nature of that threat was and how um, communities could come together in multiracial coalition to, to, to organize against them. So um, I will say in, in my research, coverage of, of the you know, earliest years of, the, of Mussolini's um, fascist regime in Italy and the kind of fascist street fighting and early murmurings in Weimar Germany, coverage in the black press was intermittent in the early years in the 1920s, but it, it was there and it was watchful. But what is really clear is that that uh, the journalists and intellectuals writing in black newspapers in the United States really from the beginning were deeply aware of a grammar of race and nation undergirding fascism. And um, you know, you see even in the in the weeks before Mussolini's march on Rome in 1922 that black newspapers are are comparing his movement to the Ku Klux Klan in the United States. And to give you a few more examples, more specific ones in 1927, there's a, a Jamaican American journalist and scholar named J.A. Rogers, who's writing um, in the Baltimore Afro-American. And let me pull up the quote. So he's he's writing in the newspaper about, he's, he's, he's reflecting on reconstruction, the tumult and the violence and the kind of erosion of democracy characteristic of the reconstruction years in the United States. But he's writing about that as his last report out of Milan, as a foreign correspondent. And, and he notes what his sources are, are telling him. So he's hearing in Italy mounting accounts of assassinations, whippings, maiming, the invasion of homes, mass arrests, the raiding and burning of newspaper offices. And he writes, no newspaper is permitted to print any hostile opinion. Labor is not permitted to go on strike. The death sentence has been revived. Jazz is not permitted. And the paper ran his article under the headline, fascism like Ku Klux. And then the following year, another journalist also covering news from Italy says, Il Duce, Il Duce joins the clan. And this is a quote that I think is really key here. The, the journalist wrote, like a true clansman, he thinks that this earth belongs to the white race and is shocked at the presumption of those of darker hue that they have a future in the world. And I think that quote is so key because Right, all these references to the Klan, right? The Klan looming large, the Klan of the 1920s, this robust, um, massive, sprawling, oftentimes very elite, while also populist organization, right? Very representative of mainstream American attitudes in the 1920s, very represented, um, you know, uh, many people in power, lawmakers, judges, police in the Klan, right? The Klan is the main point of the comparison often. Right. And in some respects, we can think of the Klan as uh, something ostensibly unique to the American political landscape. And yet this moment, right, that he thinks the earth belongs to the white race and is shocked at the presumption of those of dark hue that they have a future in the world. Right. So reference to this maybe uniquely American thing. Um, but the, but but this this writer is also thinking about 
the world, right? Also thinking about the way white power politics course through the earth, the way the violence of the Klan is related to, uh, you know, deeper histories of, of European and Euro-American racial colonial violence, right? And, and that's all just contained within a few lines in a small, you know, foreign affairs column. Um, just a few more quotes to sort of bring us up to the 1930s then. Um, the Baltimore Afro-American in 1930 covering the major gains that the Nazi party had in, in federal elections in Germany. And they warned that, quote, Germany's Ku Klux Klan was now the second strongest political party in the country. Um, and the article offered this really bleak analysis of what that meant for Germany, for the world, and specifically also for the black diaspora and, um, and observed to its readers um, that they should look at the world situation facing their Jewish neighbors and tighten their belts for the long struggle ahead. And then, um, you know, moving forward, 1932, Adolf Hitler has a failed presidential bid and the Chicago, Chicago Defender observed, um, right, that there's, there's um, they observed this growing pow power, right, and says that the Nazi party surely studied the same book as the Klan, just going under a different name. And they actually declared Hitler to be, quote, the Vardaman of Europe. And they define that as someone who's against everything Jewish and black. And that is a reference to former Mississippi governor James, uh, and Senator James K. Vardaman, um, who in his reign once vowed to lynch every black resident of his state if it would be in the service of preserving white supremacy. And then finally, in March 1933, um, as Hitler is rapidly consolidating his power, um, you see you see the same analogies unfold. In this case, right, um, a black scholar and columnist named Kelly Miller notes that the Klan model again is being used in Germany, which he defined as appeal to patriotism reinforced by the dynamics of hate. And he he also argues that. Right, what's happened is that Hitler started as this fringe rabble rouser, but is now um, achieving dictatorial power. And he says essentially, like countless Klan leaders, his platform appeals to everyday Germans, even if he himself packages his ideas in fanatical passion and pageantry. And the last quote I'll leave you with before I just, I'll show you a few political cartoons um, from this era. For Miller, right, Miller and other students of what's happening abroad, other, other major voices in the black press continue again to this, to this grammar of, of race and nation as what's, what's the connective tissue between what's happening in a place like Germany or Italy and what's happening in the United States. And, and Miller concludes, the sinister insurgence of race passion is exemplified in the Hitler movement should cause minorities in all parts of the globe to indulge in some long distance thinking. And just because the visual archive of this era is also so rich, I will briefly show you um, some political cartoons from these same newspapers across the same era. So two, right? So first April, 1933, just a few months after um, Hitler has come to power and, and is rapidly consolidating his power. And you see him right, depicted as another Klansman. Um, and then I think also increasingly, in addition to the image of the Klansmen, the black press also really takes up um, other um, sometimes specific and sometimes abstracted images of, of, sort of law and order, whether it is the police, the Jim Crow judge, the sheriff, what have you. Um, and I think more to worry about is also key, right, that this isn't necessarily a sort of distinct movement. The rise of fascism signifies a kind of mounting problem within the threats already apparent. Um, within the Jim Crow United States. And then just as a way to transition to Joe's comments, um, uh, two more panels that ran in the New York Amsterdam News in 1935. On the right is, I won't, I won't get too into this one, but this is from a noted um, black radical political cartoonist named Ollie Harrington, who's making a jab at um, white communist organizers coming up to Harlem. Um, but on the left, you'll see the headline, right? Italy, Ethiopia, war, clouds loom. And the woman reading ob observes, right? At least it's clear why Italy insists on going to war with e Ethiopia. Mussolini is still angry because Joe Lewis beat Primo Carnera. 
a noted Black American boxer, noted Italian boxer um, in a fight that I believe happened in, in New York, if I remember correctly. But um, this is this is a framework I, I I'll sort of pass on to, to Joe then, right, that that the local and the global um, are really converging within just one small panel and one issue of one newspaper. And um, with that, I think I'd, I'd love to turn it over to Joe um, to get us into this, the emergence and, and specifics of the movement itself. Thank you all so much. All right, so, I mean, uh, thank you, like everyone else has said, you know, thank you to Julie, Chad, Jenny, Holly, everyone who has put in all the work to make this happen and to make the April Institute this lantern shining, its light shining a way forward. All right, so with my, these initial comments here, I decided I should just lay out a pretty basic sense of the historic nuts and bolts of Hands Off Ethiopia. I'm, I'm a social historian at heart, and so, I think you know, specifics really are the place to to ground ourselves and to to launch from there to build from. You know, Anna's speech already brought us, you know, brought us around up to Hands Up Ethiopia, and then uh, from what I understand, Minkus is going to, uh, you know, have us launch from it. So this is this is almost like a, I'm going to give you like the internal history uh, of Hands Off Ethiopia. Uh, this is also, I mean, I think. You know, they're asking us to dream with our eyes open and to, to you know, with our eyes open, what nightmares we see. I'm, I'm giving us something much, much more simple. Uh, you could, I, I think of this as I'm, I'm giving you basically like the bass solo here in the song, which I know is everybody's favorite part of, of, of a song. Uh, but so just think of this as the, the bass solo, and I'll, I'll turn it over to, I guess, Minka, that makes you the, the, the the saxophonist, um, which, yeah, take, I thought so. There we go. All right, so at the end of 1934, there was a skirmish between Ethiopian and Italian forces at an oasis called Wall Wall. Benito Mussolini, the fascist dictator of Italy, used this as a pretext to begin mobilizing for war. He wanted to invade colonize Ethiopia, an independent African nation. And so then uh, many months later, um, you know, for all this talk about Mussolini getting the trains done on time, he didn't actually do anything all that competently, but nonetheless, by October, 1935, fascist Italy had invaded Ethiopia, begun a war and pretty soon begun a brutal occupation. So hands off Ethiopia, the movement went on after October 1935, but the movement, by the time that the war began, the movement was already very much a global thing. Um, people were already mobilizing throughout 1935 on a really epic scale. Anti-fascists, and I think you could say anti-fascists in the making, were all agitating, organizing local protests um, all over the world, like I said, you know, everywhere from... Johannesburg to Calcutta, everywhere from Tokyo to Cairo, from Montreal to Buenos Aires, uh, people were protesting. And then yes, in the United States, um, in particular in, in the black neighborhoods of the big cities, people were protesting against this very clear march to war. So I think, I hope we have time to kind of bring back some more discussion as we go forward about, about some of these local movements that made the Hands Off Ethiopia movement. Um, in, in particular, I, I'm, I'm interested in uh, the, the Harlem movement. Um, and then also, um, you know, even thinking beyond the United States, I think it's useful to, to remember, like Anna said, that this, this is a, a global movement that was very much interconnected. Um, Minka, you've written about um, the, the, the London scene, which included um, a, a speaker from the United States, fascinating um, mass protest in Trafalgar Square in August of 1935. But what I want to do right now is I just want to focus on, give you the sense of one, one local movement. I want to talk about the movement in Chicago, uh, rooted in the Black neighborhoods on the south side of Chicago. So what I want to do is I want to impress four things about this movement. First, just how quickly, how directly protest produced voice. Uh, I did 
it didn't win, it didn't prevent the war, it didn't create structural change quickly, but um, I, I wanna impress upon you that protest puts one's voice out there, again, very quickly, very directly. Uh, secondly, I wanna say the Chicago movement shows how important it is to adapt your methods of protest to your surroundings, to the built environment around you, to, ha to have a sense of place about your protest, uh, to think about how your protest fits within your given ecology. And then the third thing that I want to impress, the third thing that I think that the Chicago movement shows is simply how inspiring protest is. Um, and in particular, I'm thinking of for its participants. Uh, the Hands Off Ethiopia protests in Chicago in 1935, I think, in very clear ways, changed the direction of the lives of some of those who took part. That's something that protest does. And then the, the fourth and final thing that I think the Chicago scene shows very clearly is how central the role of the police is in shaping protest, uh, certainly in the modern United States, but I think this is a general rule. So, okay, so first we start early 1935. You have, I wanna emphasize a small group of anti-fascists or, and again, anti-fascists in the making, uh, centered in the black neighborhoods of Chicago on the South side, who at least want to make it known that their thought is Benito Mussolini ought to lay his hands off Ethiopia. And so they figure out what are they gonna do? How are they going to make that known? And so they start figuring out how they're going to organize a movement, how they're going to protest. And they come up with their first demonstration, I think is a, a real a, a beauty, a, a wonder of, of protest. Uh, they decide what are they going to do? They are far away from the border between um, the Italian colony of Somalia and the, the border of Ethiopia, where this conflict is taking form. They're on the other side of the world. What can they do? So they stage their protest at the Italian consul there in Chicago. They pick the right spot. Um, and then the, the second thing they do is they, they understand that protest is theater. They come up with this wonderfully theatrical protest. This, the heart of the protest is uh, two women among the, the, this small group, um, a white woman from the west side named Lillian Rabin and a black woman from the south side of Chicago named Eloise Robinson. They set up out front of the console and they handcuff themselves and uh, with a chain lock themselves to a lamppost in front of the console and they have on big baggy huge white sweatshirts uh, that say hands off Ethiopia and then of course as you would guess they very quickly begin to draw a crowd and anytime you draw a crowd um, in Chicago in 1935 you're also going to draw the police and the police are very frustrated to find that they cannot haul them off to jail because as I said they've locked themselves to the lamppost the, the confounding of the police is part of what is so joyful about the scene, what draws the crowd. Um, and this is downtown in the loop of Chicago. Does anyone know what, what, what makes downtown Chicago the loop? What is the loop? The L, yeah, exactly. So you have an elevated train. So you have, they are right below an elevated train station. So some of their comrades make their way up the stairs to the L station and they drop leaflets, anti-war leaflets on this gathered crowd. So they have done the work of gathering a crowd and now they're getting their message out in leaflets. It's quite a joyful scene. The police are confounded and they are trying to clear the crowd. And during all this, um, all this uh, carnival scene, some of their other comrades slip their way into the console and make their thoughts known to the Italian fascist officials there in person. This is something that they were not supposed to be allowed to do. So this was a wonderfully effective first act to the Chicago protest scene. Um, the second act, I, th I think I'll try to say very briefly, uh, they think about how to make their voice known to, you know, 
all the respectable people. Where are all the respectable people in Chicago? They're on Michigan Avenue shopping. And so on the weekends, all of a sudden, among the crowds of people shopping, all of a sudden, there's this, um, what uh, one of the organizers later called flash actions, these sudden marches that pop out of nowhere. All of a sudden, among the throngs of shoppers, there are people chanting and singing and holding up signs. Doesn't take long, again, recurring theme, doesn't take long for the Chicago police to show up. And so what happens? People drop their signs and the march disappears just like that. Another clever, creative way of, of, of protesting. And here you see, um, again, like as if it were a film negative, you see the, the weight of the, the police on the protest. They had, to, they had to figure out how to make this a flash action and then drop back into the crowds and they're protected by the crowds. And you also, I mean, think back again here to why there were those handcuffs in the last demonstration because they knew that as soon as they peaceably assembled, the police would try very hard to take them and haul them off to jail. Okay, so then the, the last thing I'll say, I'll just say the, the, the biggest protest of Chicago during 1935, later on in the summer, as it becomes more and more clear that this war is going to happen, they wanna have a mass march. The city authorities say no, no permit. And so they, they gather at a settlement house um, for a late Friday night meeting and they discuss what to do and they vote on whether to hold the parade anyway, even without permission. And the vote's unanimous. They hold their demonstration. It's gonna be a mass march down 47th Street. This is uh, in the back of the yards. This is um, the, the heart of um, black Chicago on the south side of Chicago. And so they decide they're going to hold their mass march and they know the police will be waiting for them. The police were waiting for them. Uh, and so they came up with different ways to deal with that. Once again, they used the size of the crowd to their advantage. Rather than have one person give a speech at any one point, um, all of a sudden um, amongst the crowd, someone would pop up and start a speech. The police would move in and try and grab that person and haul them off. Um, and so then someone else would pick up the speech somewhere else. And so it was this, I, I mean, according to what people said who were there, it was this beautiful thing, this um, collective act of speech. It had its own sort of wonderment to it. But then for longer speeches, so what did they decide that they wanted to do? They figured out along the marching route to have rooftop oratory. And so they set up different points along the march route where they would have people um, giving speeches from the rooftops. And you know nobody seems to have recorded very well what people said from the rooftops. What stuck with people was just that simple physical act of speaking freely. Um, and then eventually they, the police would make their way up to the rooftops and, and haul them off. And then someone else down the street would show up on a different rooftop and give a speech. So, you know, the, there were, I, I don't know how many rooftop speeches there were, there were several. Um, I know two of them, one was a man named Oliver Law and another one was a man named Harry Haywood. And, and one thing that uh, I just want to flag about the both of them is this is 1935. And so the hands-off Ethiopia movement didn't stop the war in Ethiopia from happening. And they didn't even, one thing that they thought about trying to do is, was organize volunteer militias to go fight against the fascists in Ethiopia. Um, and they, they, didn't, they didn't pull that off, but it was a dry run for the big fascist offensive in 1936. What was the big move by the fascists of the world in 1936? What's the big historic Spain? And those two rooftop orators, Oliver Law and Harry Haywood, uh, they took a steamer across the ocean and they fought against fascism in Spain, the both of them. So again, uh, didn't prevent the invasion, but what a statement of solidarity these anti-fascists made on the south side of Chicago in 1935. Um, they certainly showed voice. Um, what a forceful statement in part because as I've tried to say, they paid attention to their built environment. They adapted their protest to their surroundings. They paid very careful attention 
to the sense of place, whether it be the rooftops of 47th Street or the L station above the Italian consul down in the loop on Wells Street. Um, and then a you know, third, like I said, yes, from these quick little impressionistic stories that I've told, you see the weight of the police and shaping protest. And two things to take from that. Yeah, the police are gonna show up and try to stop that protest, but also notice how people played with that. And they made that part of the theater of their protest. Uh, part of what was so inspiring about those rooftop speeches was that the police couldn't get them right away. And what, what joy people took from seeing that physical liberty, as I said. And then, and then fourth, I said, how inspiring protests can be even for participants. And you know, I think the likes of Raven and Robinson of, of Law and, and Haywood and what an influence this had on their lives. Like I said, at least two of them ended up in Spain only months later. And um, I guess at that point, I'll turn it over to Minka. So I'm going to um, make this far more complicated on myself than I need to and try and show a, um, a couple of slides and then a brief video clip. But I, um, I wanna thank Chad, Julie for the invitation, um, Holly for the work and being patient with me in terms of travel and um, everyone else who's made this possible. Uh, when I got the invitation, I was very excited to come and participate in this. I also knew other people who were participating in the previous meetings, um, some of whom I've known for a long time, some of, who, some of whom I've admired for even longer. Um, and then over the past year, I've kind of felt that we need to bring some other kinds of elements into this discussion. So I wanna start with um, the woman in the middle of the frame here. Um, and this is October 6th, 1969. This is the 25-year-old Angela Davis, and she's entering the UCLA, uh, it's Royce Hall, University of California's Royce Hall, to deliver her first lectures as an acting assistant professor in philosophy. And I'll just say that when I went to give my first lecture um, almost 20 years ago, I was nervous as hell with eight students. Over 1,500 students, faculty, and activists packed Royce Hall to hear her lecture. They did so because the previous summer, after she had been appointed as an acting assistant professor, the Board of Regents under the direction of Governor Ronald Reagan fired her because she was a member of the Communist Party. Angela Davis um, had been a member of the Communist Party. She was a member of the Black Panther Party. She was a part of the all Black Communist uh, uh, formation, the Chela Mumba Club, and was unabashed in her political affiliations. Um, ultimately, she sued, and the Superior Court of California ruled that she could not be barred from teaching because she was a communist. However, Reagan, ever persistent, uh, appointed an investigating committee that would investigate a series of off-campus statements that Angela Davis had made over the course of that year. And while they found that she had not been indoctrinating her students, that her quote unquote inflammatory rhetoric off campus were grounds for her dismissal. Now, listen to Reagan explaining what happened. Quote, it was based wholly on the questions that were brought up at the, at the ad hoc faculty committee with regard to her remarks and her conduct and speaking around the various campuses. And it was believed that this displayed an unprofessional conduct. And it was on this basis that the regents voted that she not be rehired. A very legitimate reasoned process of the state, I'm sure they would have explained. What was Davis's inflammatory rhetoric? The committee identified as quote, particularly offensive such utterances as her statement that the board of regents quote, killed, brutalized and murdered the People's Park demonstrators and her repeated characterization of the police as quote unquote pigs. And for good measure, the committee also noted that Davis was, quote, less than fair in her characterizations of the views of fellow scholars with whom she disagreed. Now, again, this is because they can't fire her for being a communist. But Angela Davis was talking about Reagan's actions in what is known as Bloody Thursday, the May 
15, 1969 decision by Reagan to send state troopers and police into Berkeley's People's Park. Um, and Reagan had long complained about the UC campus as being a hotbed of radicalism, uh, but he put the entire city for a little over two weeks under martial law, um, using tear gas spraying helicopters. Uh, the riot police killed one protester, maimed another, and blinded him actually with buckshot and arrested hundreds. Even at one point, uh, when one protest happened along a main thoroughfare, not only getting the protesters, the people who ran businesses, pulling them out of their businesses and arresting them. So this was the nature of what she was talking about when she identified, if we are to believe this committee, that the regents had killed, brutalized, and murdered the, Peace Park, the People's Park protesters. So her, her firing, I want to suggest, though, is not simply about her inflammatory rhetoric. This was politically convenient for Reagan, but a more fundamental concern was what Davis was teaching. Now listen to this quote from Angela Davis. We have to talk about a complete and total change to the structure of this society, because that's the only way that a concept like academic freedom is going to be made relevant. We have to go to the streets. Davis posed both a political, but perhaps more importantly, an epistemological threat to the dominant order. Consider that her first lecture at Royce Hall Davis, where Davis made clear her view that, quote, education should not mold the mind according to a, pre, a prefabricated architectural plan. It should rather liberate the mind and create human beings who possess a genuine concern for their fellow human beings. The topic of those lectures, which have been published as lectures on liberation and can be found online, focused on a conception of freedom that was drawn from black literature. Davis argued that while freedom had dominated the history of Western ideas, quote, black literature provides a much more illuminating account of the nature of freedom, its extent and limits, than all the philosophical discourses of this, on this theme in the history of Western society. So rather than follow normative approaches found in philosophy or political theory, Davis turned to black literature because, quote, it projects the consciousness of a people who have been denied entrance into the world into the real world of freedom. Black people have exposed by their very existence the inadequacies not only of a practice of freedom, but of its very theoretical formulation. So I begin with this because I want to bring into view the long history of fascism in the United States, United States, which has developed a repertoire of policies, modes of governance, and state practices that are too often sequestered from discussions of fascism in Europe. Consider then that Reagan's charges against Davis follow a long line of arguments about the nature of academic freedom that seeks to delimit knowledge production to what is considered legitimate and legitimates the West as a civilization's project. It is this much longer project that we see today culminating in attacks on critical race theory and most dynamically in Ron DeSantis's attacks on black studies, women and gender studies. Note that he's, uh, his proposal would, out, would, would ban any major or minor in women and gender studies? Are any ideas, or modes of instruction, or knowledge production that calls into question the guiding assumption that freedom is the unique province of the West? And I think it's also not coincidental, uh, not, excuse me, it's not unimportant that Reagan is attacking Angela Davis and DeSantis is focused in, as well as Mark Rufo, have focused in on those ideas that have been developed by black radical women. Um, Kimberly Crenshaw, critical race theory, not just, but, but pioneer, um, intersectionality, um, et cetera. And so you see the same thing going on. And just for, you know, point of emphasis, um, the Board of Regents didn't fire a, um, an administrator at University of California, Irvine, who was brought up in the same meeting in the summer of 1970, where they fired Angela Davis. And this person had been a member of the Students for Democratic Society, um, was considered a radical, and the president of um, UC Irvine wanted him fired, but he wasn't, and just so happens, totally accidental, that he was white, right? Um, it's also not important that in 1983, Reagan sent in troops to invade and occupy Grenada under the premise that it was a destabilized government and that it threatened the region. And so you see in these actions, both forecasting, 
a bit of Ron DeSantis, um, but also echoing, particularly in Granada, Thomas Jefferson's sense of the US as an empire of liberty. This is Jefferson, quote, we shall add to the empire of liberty an extensive and fertile country, thereby converting dangerous enemies into valuable friends. And this idea of the United States as this beacon of democracy that, as Wilson put it, you know, must go into World War I to defend, to make, demo make the world safe for democracy. Uh, and one black veteran who you can find this quote in Chad Williams's work, Coach Bearers of Democracy, makes this really pithy point. Um, we fought to make the world safe for democracy. Now we seek to make democracy safe for Negroes. And I think this captures an element in black political thought that has a longstanding analysis of the link between Western practices of democracy and fascism. Consider the 1927 statement by Richard B. Moore, a Barbadian radical who was a member of the African Black Brotherhood and one of the earliest black communists in the world. Um, and this is in Brussels at the International Congress Against Colonial Oppression and Imperialism, where he insists that, quote, the fight against imperialism is first of all, an incessant struggle against imperialistic ideology, which includes, quote, fascism, the Ku Klux Klan, chauvinism, and the doctrine of the white supremacy, of the supremacy of the white race. Put differently, as Cedric Robinson argues, black political thought has long broken, sorry, I'm just trying to keep track of time, has long broken with, the, with Western historiography's attempt to render fascism a quote, negation of the Western guys, to insist instead on fascism as a logic of the West, much like working class black protests in the in, uh, to the 1935 Italian invasion of Ethiopia, both in the US, the Caribbean, South Africa, um, you have people like Padmore who would put the argument, who would put the point that Italy was part of a long history of European exploit, exploitation of African peoples and lands uh, and of quote, white nations joining hands and assigning parts of Africa to whichever one stands most in need of colonies. And he's referencing here the 1885 Berlin Conference where Europe carved up Africa for various European powers. Or take C.L.R. James's 1947 statement that, quote, only a shallow empiricism can fail to see that such monstrous societies as Stalinist Russia and fascist Germany are not the product of a national peculiarity or system, i.e. Germany or, or communist Russia, but a part and parcel of our civilization. In assessing the degradation, excuse me, in assessing the degeneration and decay of Western civilization, I do not separate East from West, fascism from democracy. Now I wanna play, and I'm, I understand I'm moving really quickly, but I wanna play this clip from a film called Camp de Théoir. This is by a Senegalese filmmaker named Osma Semben. Um, he has a really good catalog, but this is a very compelling movie about the decommissioning of French West African troops following World War II. And, there is a exchange between the character on the left, um, Sergeant Giata, and a figure of white liberal French enlightenment. Um, and this is where Giata is talking about the, the a massacre in his home village, Ifoc, and how he draws a connection between the French and the Nazis. What's up? Votre costume de tirailleur alors que vous allez être démobilisé d'ici quelques jours Parce que nous ne sommes pas des citoyens français, nous sommes des sujets français. Et pourquoi vous n'avez pas pris la nationalité française Vous êtes instruit, non La nationalité française Non merci. Je reste africain et je garde mon instruction. Vous avez toujours l'intention de poursuivre vos études en France Oui Dès ma libération, j'irai à Efok, mon village, visiter les ruines. Je comptais justement vous y inviter. Hélas. Les ruines de votre village Vous n'êtes pas au courant Non. Les soldats se sont rendus à Efok, mon village, pour réquisitionner le riz. Les femmes s'y sont opposées et notre vaillante armée de planquer à l'arrière a tiré sur une population sans défense. Efok a été rasé. Mon père et ma mère s'y trouvaient. C'est horrible. Ça s'est passé quand Il y a deux ans. 
toutes mes condoléances, Aloïse. Vous avez nommé votre fille du nom de votre mère, Bissom, c'est cela Oui. 1942, c'était encore euh, les vichistes. Les temps changent, les mentalités également. Vous avez suivi la conférence de Brazzaville Il me sera difficile d'oublier. Voyez-vous, je fais un parallèle entre Efok et Ouradour sur Glam. Ah, vous ne pouvez pas faire une telle comparaison. On ne peut pas comparer la barbarie nazie à, aux exactions de l'armée française. Non, ce n'est pas possible. C'est l'armée coloniale. Même mentalité. Les officiers qui en 1940 ont refusé le ralliement des forces de l'AOF aux forces françaises libres et qui ont fusillé des Sénégalais ralliés à ces forces sont les mêmes officiers qui sont à présent aux côtés du chef de la France libre et contrôlent les colonies. Ne vous en portez pas. Vous connaissez bien le peuple de France. Vous savez que ça n'est pas pareil. You can't compare Nazi barbarism with the excesses of our army. Now, in this, I think Semben is um, really citing Aimé Césaire's point in discourse on colonialism that the real problem that the West had with Hitler is not the crime against man as such, but that they had Hitler had unleashed on Europeans, on Europe, on white men, the crimes that had been enacted against Middle Easterns, Indians, and Africans. And he uses this language that I won't use um, out of respect for everyone. But to bring this back around to Angela Davis and DeSantis and how to look at how I want to look at this history of Black anti-fascism in the current period. When the Unite the Right rally happened in Charlottesville and Heather Hoyer was killed, in the middle of the night that weekend, the university president at the University of Texas at Austin moved to have Confederate statuary removed from the quad, um, something that students have been asking for for a while. And it wasn't like Black people hadn't been killed or threatened for a while and making these demands. But I think Cesare's point and the point that Giata is getting at is well taken here. And I think the DeSantis reflects a response not too different from that. Um, and that is a response not merely to uprisings of BLM from at least 2012 um, or 2014 to 2020 and the global currency of that, but also the currency and popularity of calls to defund and abolish the police following the murder of um, um, George Floyd in Minneapolis. And I think this is what we're looking at in the same way that Reagan was seeking to substantiate a particular social order. We see that today and it's gaining currency. So whether or not DeSantis wins is less of an issue, just like it's less of an issue if Trump wins. It's more so how do we then respond to the normal workings of the United States and understanding this as part of a longer history that gives fascism its currency um, and its livelihood and its persistence to come back in various forms. Okay, I'd like to um, open it up to our panelists to um, ask each other questions or comment on um, their presentations um, for a few minutes before uh, we open up the questions from the audience. Um, is Anna on screen behind me? Should yeah. I should I should I be on the screen? <laughs> sure. Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm just going to open it up to see if anyone wants to start a conversation between the panelists about uh, and draw any connections or um, ask any uh, questions. Hi, Anna. It's Joe. So I'm I'm really thinking mostly uh, that maybe you could answer this, and then maybe Minka you could respond to her answer. So to me, one of the things that Minka's speech pursued and that is just so intrinsic to the hands-off Ethiopia movement of 1935 is that imperialism and fascism can't get away from each other. And so I'm wondering, you were talking about these kind of like comparisons between the Klan and the Italian fascisti being made in the, in the black press. I'm wondering like, is it only when you get to the hands off Ethiopia movement that people are saying that 
imperialism isn't can't be understood as just simply empire anymore, but that this is this is fascist um, aggression. Uh, or or did, did people mm-hmm. already figure that out before 1935? I guess in simplest terms, my 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 hunch is that it 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 it, it predates it, right? And that and that there there's a there's a there's a murmuring and there's an analysis that predates this sort of grassroots global movement, which then also gives the movement. A sort of additional heft. I mean, the first, the first. Um, again, I feel like my 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 my. I've sort of taken up the role here tonight of occupying the the, the archival headlines. And one of the things that's so key is that um, for um, the the black press in the United States, for instance, um, in the lead up to the Italian invasion of Ethiopia, the first connection that they're making is the. U.S. invasion and occupation of Haiti, right, which ran from 1915 to 1934, um, and was actively covered in the black press for the duration. And right, it's 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 um, you know um, the other free black nation on earth at that time, and so the connection is glaring. Um, the even like the images of it are sim- similar. Um, and you can just see, right, all of these like threads and connections being made in the press. But I know that this was also, I mean, I think Cesare's um, uh, characterization of, of, of uh, fascism as sort of the ravages of a uh, vampire carried out on the European continent, right, um, is, 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 some, is one of the most sort of robust and clear-eyed and full-throated um, expressions of that. But I know Padmore was writing about that too, sort of in the early 1930s and notably, right, Padmore um, was was working for the Communist International in Hamburg when the Nazis came to power and was deported by the Nazi government, right? So, I mean, so I think both of you really spoke. I think that the, these these global connections are so key, but but I just have been struck in my research by how quickly the kind of racial imperial connection is so, um, is so clear from the beginning. And, and of course, I think hands off Ethiopia is a big tipping point. I think also once um, the Nazi government starts to expand and um, you know annex neighboring countries and certainly with the onset of the war, um, the in sort of arguments about, I mean, in the black press, you also see a lot of invocation of the American settler colonial project across the continent and the dispossession and genocide of na- native populations as, as, a, as a point of comparison too. Um, but I think the, the, the common, it all comes down to an argument of shared roots, right? I think across the kind of left liberal political perspective you see in the black press, um, you don't always see the kind of full articulation of a, a fusion of an, an anti-imperial, anti-colonial and anti-fascist struggle um, but the the analogy flows really readily, um, and it often the, the shared ar- ar- argument, especially within the sort of common sense anti fascist politics, is a sense of shared roots and a kind of um, in black public discourse a kind of obviousness that um, Mussolini and the regimes of Mussolini and Hitler are both learning from European and American racial colonial precedents, and then also. What I think is really striking is um, the black press sort of really actively observes that it does seem that the Nazi regime is drawing on American jurisprudence. Um, and I think what's really key is, is scholarship has taken up these arguments in the last 20 years, right? There was a big turn about 25 years ago in German history, sort of thinking about um, Hitler's imperial ambitions, but right, that that black journalists and thinkers are, are writing about this a hundred years ago was really key. Yeah, thanks. I mean, you're you're totally right. I mean, of course, Haiti. Um, and then I think of um, C.L.R. James at the beginning of Black Jacobins. He says this is a, this is a book that one could only write in the age of fascism. And I understand how to write this. And uh, and also, you know, you've written about how uh, C.L.R. James was active in protests in in London uh, against the invasion of, of Ethiopia. And I, I've always I've always thought that. Um, and there's something beautiful in that he had written um, wonderful works of history about uh, his his home country Trinidad and Tobago um, before 
he took part in this transnational movement. And then after he took part in this huge world spanning um, protest movement with questions of empire and fascism, that that's when he wrote this big splashing masterpiece. But I don't know if you want to. Right. And I just will to, to wrap it up really quickly, right? It matters so much that in addition to sort of Black American writers, that the some of the, the kind of forefathers of Black anti-fascist thought are British colonial subjects, right? Whether it's James, whether it's Padmore, whether it's Claudia Jones, um, right? So are already bringing a kind of anti-imperialist critique to anti-fascist analysis just from, from the very beginning. Yeah, and I would just add to that, that there is, um, throughout the 19 teens, particularly after you have the US occupation of Haiti, and then a year later, the occupation of the Dominican Republic. And at this time, the Dominican Republic was clearly understood as a black nation. Um, and then you have World War I and Wilson's 14 points of why the US is entering the war and what the goals are, which become the foundation for the League of Nations. Uh, you have a black radical press um, critiquing the arguments that are being made around questions of self-determination that are being made around political independence and that are being made around democracy because the US is an imperial power at that time. And so it's not just this domestic power that is trying to confront in fumbling ways racial oppression, but is actively engaged in exporting these racial practices and logics throughout the Western hemisphere. And there's this real clear sense that this is confined in terms of um, this, this buoyant democracy is confined to a European context. It doesn't apply to the Philippines. It doesn't apply to Haiti. It doesn't apply to the Dominican Republic. It doesn't apply to the US South. And I think what you, you see happen is that when you begin to get the, the rise of fascism and, and an attention to that, um, and I think this is what Robinson is trying to get at. You can find he has two real good essays. They overlap in many ways, but they're in um, the collection, Cedric Robinson on racial capitalism and the black intellectual tradition. Um, but what you have is an attention that is persistent to the nature of racial oppression and colonialism throughout the world that once you get the rise of fascism, people are pointing out that what we are seeing is almost identical to what has already been going on. And then um, a, a woman by the name of Zoe Samudzi has pointed this out in, in response, because I think there's a, a very good point to be made about um, uh, Nazi Germany drawing legal rationale and juridical justification from the United States. But she points out that, which is a very obvious point that people apparently don't, don't make that often, Germany does have the Herrera genocide. It does have its own practices on the African continent. And ironically, at the same, the same year that Discourse on Colonialism comes out and um, Aimé Césaire's discussion of uh, these practices being brought back on Europe, Hannah Arendt makes a very similar argument about German colonial practices in Africa bringing a racial logic back to Europe. Now, I think what the Black radical tradition would say, someone like Césaire would say, was that that racial logic was already there in Germany. We see it in 1885. We see it, um, some would argue, from 1492, and that we have to really understand how it unfolds, how it develops, how it is nimble enough to navigate and respond to different kinds of situations. And this is where I think James's point about, the, the, you know, we can't rely on a false empiricism because then that allows us to separate what happens in the British Empire, in the French Empire, in the Belgian uh, territories in Africa, in uh, Angola, Mozambique, Guinea-Bissau, Cape Verde, from what happens in Italy, what happens in Spain, what happens in Germany. And it's not unimportant, and I'd be interested to get your thoughts on this, that in 1937, you have Black people around the world, they hold a World Congress against racism and white supremacy that is very little talked about. I think I just mentioned it, but I have found very little that's written about this. But this is at the same time that Black working class people and Black activists are going to fight in Spain in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, because as Robin Kelly points out, you know they weren't able to go and fight in Ethiopia. Um, um, his article, this is in Ethiopia, but it'll do. 
there's just been this long tradition of trying to insist and expose the limits and the hypocrisy of Western democracy, of enlightenment ideals that have consistently and explicitly been premised, and this is actually an empirical point, they have been premised and built upon forms of freedom, forms of democratic practice, forms of political association that are supported and stands on the back and blood of people who are colonized in Africa, Asia, and exterminated and colonized in the Americas. And so I think that's what really um, is, is potentially easily overlooked, which isn't to negate how unique a flashpoint the Third Reich might have been or Mussolini might have been, but it's not to see this as an aberration, but that this is a development out of series of practices that we can actually identify and are longstanding. Yes, I mean, I just briefly, I mean, that was basically Benito Mussolini's response was, you know, all these protests saying, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, fascism, that you see, it's a, it's a global menace. It's coming after all of us. It's Ethiopia today, you tomorrow. It's basically his response was, what are you talking? This is no different than what Europe has been doing. I'm just, I'm, I'm just. This isn't. This is. He said, this isn't the fascist project. This is just statecraft. This is just Europe needing to have, you know, um, you know. He didn't. He didn't use the 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 language, but he, he meant, you know, living space. Um, that's 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 what he was doing. He was just, you know, being uh, a European empire. Um, yeah, just um, because of time, I'd like to open it up now to um, audience questions. Because of because um, we have people watching, attending remotely, I would like to give you the mic to ask your question so that they can um, hear a question. We don't have to repeat it. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand and I'll bring the mic to you. Hi, uh, this might be a, kind of a dumb question. I kind of showed up late, so I apologize for that. But I do just want to know, like, um, with the war in Tigray, I wonder what if like the hands off Ethiopia movement had any influence on like the war in Tigray and spreading in misinformation or in foreign involvement in that to an extent. Would anyone like to take that? Anna or other panels? I'll just say I I don't know, but uh, I mean the 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 language of hands off Ethiopia, that that's stuck, that's still there. Like you see that. Um that that phrase, for, you know, it, it still did, it didn't uh, disappear, and so people still talk about it with Tigray. They say hands off Ethiopia. Yeah, but I also just say that, um, and Majid Majiste has a, two really good novels about Ethiopia, both around 1970, but mm -hmm. um, with the the Italian occupation, um, and so in that you see kind of a novelistic presentation of criticisms of the Ethiopian crown. Those criticisms were part of the Black radical discourse at the time. And so it was um, a sense that there were serious problems with Selassie's rule and the nature of, you know, we might say caste or racial difference within Ethiopia itself that both mapped on to um, uh, distinction between what is now Eritrea, or I don't know if that extends back that far, but. Um, so there were criticisms at the time of the nature of Ethiopian society and politics, but that they refused to let that influence or tamp down their criticism of Italy. Whether that carries forward, I, honestly, I wouldn't know either, I have to say. Um, I had a question about how you would uh, consider fascism in the United States, given that fascism obviously affects different groups of people differently. Couldn't you maintain that the United States has always been a fascist state for the indigenous black and otherwise marginalized people? And couldn't you make parallels between the idea of living space and the ideas of manifest destiny in the Louisiana Purchase? And um, I wonder what you would say in reference in relation to that um, about race as a colonial construct. If I just under, if I understood the first part of your question, you were asking um, about fascism and kind of the longstanding experiences of indigenous and black people, or, or did I misunderstand that part of the question? That was, that's it. Um, yeah. So I, I I think well, part of what I might say 
as myself, not just looking at what has been said um, by Black radical thinkers, is that we we should be careful to talk about um, fascism as such existing transhistorically. Because at the point when we say that this experience is a fascist experience writ large, we kind of lose an analytical precision and ability to kind of highlight what exactly we're talking about at different times. I think the, in terms of the arguments that were being made, it isn't so much that there's fascism writ large, at least the point that I'm trying to draw out. It's more so that what we think about as Western democracy and freedom, the things that fascism are seen to be in a, a detour from, a break from, or a rupture from, so that Germany isn't seen as a product of democratic practice. It's seen as an aberration or a break from that. Um, I think there's a, a point to be made there, but at the same time, we have to deal with what are the actual practices, mechanisms, and rationales at given historical points in time that help us understand, say, the extermination of indigenous peoples, the enslavement of African peoples, the indentureship of Asians coming in the late 18th, in the late 19th century to both the US and uh, the Caribbean, right? That isn't to say that what, how people are responding to Ethiopia and then the kinds of arguments that that gives us and the kinds of ways that they're trying to understand what's happening in the 1930s and 40s and then how the US has existed, how the West has existed, so Britain and France, et cetera, uh, isn't important. But I, I do think that there has to be, in terms of how we look back at it now, we do have to have that precision at the same time that we're talking about um, how people are refusing a, a, a clear moral, ethical, political distinction between fascism as an ideology and enlightenment. Because at that point, then if you ally that, then I think you're getting to your very point that how do you understand freedom? How do you understand enlightenment ideals in the context in which they emerge, which is colonialism? And in that sense, um, I think there, uh, there's a way to understand race as a colonial logic, um, but there are also ways that we might think about, and, and this is where I'm drawing on such a Robinson explicitly, what we understand as race and how it functions, depending on how we understand that, we can see that as something that's an issue of a much longer process than just the period of colonialism that we are thinking about. Um, so that 1492 might be a breaking point and give us a distinct form, but that it may not necessarily be the simple explanatory um, moment of race then is a, is a, a product of imperialist or capitalist um, actions, that it actually is something that's much more endemic to the structures of Western thought. And Anna, if I can't see you, so you'll have to just speak up. Yeah, you... I, can, I can say something on that too, because I do find, right, um, in in sort of opening up the the archives of this the, this world of of, I mean, I struggle sometimes narratively to describe the kind of newspapers I was I was sharing at the outset because sometimes the writer is working in pure analogy, um, right? Sometimes they do just want to draw a connection. Um, as a means of provoking um, the federal government to understand what they're going through, right? The argument of so many Black Americans during the 30s and 40s was, well, why, is, why does our country feel the need to mobilize a large-scale total war against this enemy abroad when what the enemy abroad is doing looks a lot like what they're doing to us back home, right? So sometimes, sometimes it's 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 this moment of it is there is an analogy involved, but then what I become really interested in is when you start to draw the connect the direct lines, right? And I feel like. Um, in my work, I'm interested in, in, in mapping those direct connections, mapping like actual human encounters, seeing how many clicks away um, you, you can get between a comparison and an actual, um, something a little bit messier. I think I hesitate though, when I open it up, because I do sometimes find people say, well, could we say this is fascist? Could we say this is fascist? And I think an anxiety about that slippery slope is what drives a lot of people to want to just not engage in this conversation at all. Um, and as a historian, right, I think I'm, I'm, I was initially struck by just the saturation of this language in the archives. And what I think 
um, is the the rise sort of global domination and sort of military collapse of fascism um, that happens in the 20s, 30s, um, and 40s, but mostly between right 33 and 43. That opens up in Black anti-fascist discourse uh, a new way to talk about um, exactly what what um, Minka was saying, right? That 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 to challenge the idea that fascism is some monstrous other, right? To challenge the idea that fascism is is a break, is an aberration, is a is a is some kind of exceptional nightmare scenario, but rather right is more like a doppelganger, right? Or is more like a kind of odd bedfellow to democracy, right? Which often in the context of the United States then served to to, to argue against the reality that there was a democracy in the United States at all. Um, so I think, right, if we're to if we're to understand, right, the the act in this moment, um, I think it often comes down to the 30s and 40s opening up a moment in the United States led by Black radical thinkers, but also everyday people to really challenge the demarcation line between fascism and democracy. And this is this this is this is um, an argument I'm, I'm learning um, from Cedric Robinson as well as Paul Gilroy, but to just develop a kind of vigilance about the instability and porousness between so-called liberal democracy and so-called fascism, right? And, and Paul, Paul Gilroy says, right, especially what happens after 1945 when, right, there's, there's no fascist regimes any, anymore, right, is, is, is there's an impulse in the Black radical tradition to adopt a vigilance about where one form of violent politics begins and the other ends, um, essentially before it's too late. Okay, thank you. We'll take this uh, question and it'll be our last. What happens to the hands off Ethiopia movement, um, especially in the United States uh, and especially in the context of the Second World War? Um, do, do these activists fold neatly into supporting the, the Allied war effort? Um, uh, that that that's what I'm interested in. Uh, I, I would like to know how that they, what are the contours of that support, um, especially with the previous pre pre war considerations and connections between um, fascist states and liberal democracies. How 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 comfortably do these uh, activists then a decade later fall into? Do do they join the armies? Do they support this war effort? Anyone want to? volunteer to start that one. Joe. Yeah, I mean, so a lot of them do, but uh, a lot of them are also dead. Uh, a lot of them already died in Spain. Um, but I think it ties to, this is, I think, one of the great anti-fascist feats is to challenge places like the United States to draw that line sharply between themselves and fascism. You know, everybody, like, during the Cold War, everybody talks about like Cold War civil rights and how like the United States had to draw a sharp contrast between itself and the Soviet Union. And so that created space for, for civil rights actors. Um, but like that dynamic started already with World War II with um, um, trying to draw that sharp contrast between uh, the allies and the, the fascist powers. And so, you know, I mean, you, you, saw, you see this in the, in the moment, like the, the American right, you know, FDR saying like, we are fighting for democracy against fascism. And th this is like the origins of the right saying like, oh, we're not a democracy. Don't call the United States a democracy. It's wrong to call the United States a democracy. They don't like that maneuver, but th that, that talk comes out of this moment because the United States is pushed to make itself um, the antithesis to fascism. Like you said, to like create, this is like the invention of that, um, way of thinking of fascism as this great outlier, this this thing that isn't um, part uh, of the broader history of um, you know modernity. And so I think um, you know, they, they, they push the United States to make that and people are interested in that. And so people are interested and then they're interested in, in pushing that forward uh, even in, in, in the, in the post-war. One of the things that uh, I've read 
uh, Anna's dissertation, one of the things that uh, amazes me about it is that she makes clear that Robert F. Williams, who's a civil rights worker in North Carolina, uh, he's most prominent in the, in the late 50s into the 60s, uh, that he was a real, very serious, sincere anti-fascist. And that he got that in this earlier moment. And he was a soldier in the, in the US Army during World War II. And he took seriously this rhetoric of the United States as um, an anti-fascist army. Um, and they were interested in, in, in making the United States live up to that standard. So I think um, they were interested in pursuing what you're talking about, and they were interested in making it happen. They knew that they, it's not like they, they said, oh, well, there, there's that poster that says the United States is anti-fascist, and so I will go and list. But no, that they, like, this is, this is a, a moment of possibility, and I'm going to seize that. You know, just add that um, one of the things that is unique about the post-World War II moment is that you have a decided shift in Black public discourse away from kind of, you know, to, to use Du Bois's closed ranks, 1919 or whenever it was, um, around World War I, you know, let's, let's serve and demonstrate our, our, our fitness to the nation. There's a much more decided critique of the U.S. state that issues out of that. Now, it, it, it takes various different forms, but when you look at what people are saying that we're talking about in the 30s and in the 40s, and then you look at the language that you get in the civil rights movement. So, you know, it's, it's people are understanding that they are arguing for rights of citizenship, et cetera, but they are calling for freedom, let freedom ring. Uh, freedom now, so forth and so on. And then this then gives way to Black power, which is this much more fundamental challenge to the very structures of the society, how it is both economically, socially, politically structured. And this, I think, is what Angela Davis is kind of distilling in that notion that we have to talk about the structures of the society. When we talk about academic freedom, how do we change the way that we train people to think and be good human beings. So I, I, I think it's it's a number of ways that it that it plays out. Um, and then, you know, again, there's, there's always this back and forth. So what is the response in terms of not merely the Cold War, but McCarthyism and the, the disciplining and, and exacting price from so many Black radicals in particular? Um, not only CLR Jane, well, that's before, um, no, it's, no, it's after 55, uh, Claudia Jones, um, then Paul Robeson, uh, the B.B. Du Bois, and then you have the, these, these much more, you know, if you look at really the 1960s up to now as this kind of pushback against that radical current that begins with the hands off Ethiopia and, and with World War II. Because I think part of what happens in this period is that by and large people, the black public sphere, rejects the idea that we're going to demonstrate our way into freedom and into equality. And so they have to be much more strident demands. Um, again, I, I, Chad Williams, his work kind of focuses on World War I, but I think he's the person, at least that I know of, who would probably best be suited to talk about what that looks like and how that plays out in the series of wars and conflicts that Black people get drawn into and drafted into following World War I. I mean, World War II, excuse me. Anna, would you like to last word since Joe cited your dissertation? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll just to say, you know, I think that there's there's been so much wonderful scholarship in recent years that have argued that that we really need to look to the 30s and 40s to understand the full arc of the civil rights movement. Um, and I think we're, we're describing the sort of broad grassroots movement. Hand, hands off Ethiopia was a sort of sprawling thing that united all of these different individual organizations that in their sort of other iterations were working on civil rights, labor rights issues, um, you know, housing reform, all sorts of things. But, but there's a lot of complexity and heterogeneity within that. So I think for many people, for many Black Americans, you know, the very nature that the United States was fighting against the fascists opened up space for there to be a kind of mainstream resonance of what was otherwise a, a kind of radical anti-fascist tradition. Um, and I think the, as, as my co-presenters described, the, the suddenness with which that is shut down in 45, I think is so key and so radicalizing 
for for a few who could survive the the ravages of the Red Scare, right? But that the the double V campaign, which was such a motivator for um, uh, Black Americans, right? The idea that we're fighting for democracy abroad and at home, though some pushed it further and sort of shifted it said, no, we're fighting against fascism abroad and at home, right? That's That has such reach during the war that the question becomes in 1945, well, well we beat the fascists abroad, so what's happening back, back here? But I will also say there were um, radical anti-fascist pac pacifists who refused to fight in the Jim Crow army. Um, and among them was was Bayard Rustin, right, who is the architect of, of the civil rights movement and the March on Washington, right? So there was complexity. Um, and I, I think where there's just a richness in this early era that I, I encourage you all to, to dig into further. Just very briefly, what, what Anna said made me think. So one of the things that comes out of this conversation is just how much some of the great Black scholarship of the last decades has come from people who are thinking seriously about the, the hands-off Ethiopia moment. Um, and I mean, just scholar after scholar, and, and you mentioned Robin Kelly's It Ain't Ethiopia, but it'll do explaining why Black Americans would go fight in Spain. And I would just add that uh, Robin Kelly's among the scholars that Florida axed from the, the Black Studies AP curriculum. And you, know, you don't have to think that the census is, is a fascist to recognize that this anti-fascist tradition of, of thought is inconvenient for him. And it's a problem for people like them. And they're trying to you know, erase it. Thank you. And with that, I wanna thank our, our panelists. I wanna thank our audience, both remote and in person. Uh, shout out to Ashley uh, Lawrence Sanders, who's been a part of uh, past events and is with us here today. Thank you to Julie. Thanks to the tech people for making this happen. Um, please uh, stick around and ask questions if you have time. So thank you very much and have a good evening.